Oh, sure. There are certain mechanical decisions other games have done better. I'm not even talking about some of the philosophical choices made. I'm talking about weird mechanics which designers appear to refuse to deviate from. Concepts not only carried over from past editions, but ones recent editions, including 5th edition and Pathfinder, still insist on adhering to. There are many staples of D&D, ones which we know will never change, but the following list are issues which I wish they would address. Beyond the statistical flaws present in comparing a d20 roll against a 3 die 6, your actual attribute value means very little. Think about it. When is your attribute score ever used? Back in the old editions, every numerical increase gave you something. But that stopped nearly 20 years ago. In 4th edition, your constitution score was used to generate hit points at first level, but that was it. Everything else was derived from your attribute bonus, which is itself derived from said attribute score. But if that's true, why have an attribute score in the first place? It does nothing anymore other than give you a fixed number. Oh sure, there's that mechanic indicating that you only gain another plus one attribute bonus from two increments of your score, but that's easily worked around. Other games don't bother. So someone has a negative one to charisma instead of an eight. It means exactly the same thing. And the negative one is applicable to rolls while the eight is not. At one point, there was some reason for it back in the old days, but it hasn't in a really long time. Isn't it unusual that a wizard gaining his knowledge from reading spellcraft is cursed to forget his spells at the beginning of each day? I'm aware of the need for limiting the use of spells, but inventive writers have worked around this dilemma for decades. The best idea D&D can come up with is that magic somehow wipes its knowledge from the guy who spends the whole of his life trying to remember it. Ironic? Yes. An annoying meta rule to work around logical problems? Yes. Necessary? No. This is another Wheel of Fortune conundrum. You know of that of which I speak. When choices are limited, people eventually just pick the same options as, as everyone else. Since wizards need to select certain spells to use each day, it precludes them from doing anything actually clever. They've tried to work around this with the use of rituals, but even 5th edition and Pathfinder have, have still wrapped their hands around this obsolete concept that magic acts like a dick. Wizards require a long rest and are then forced to select which spells to memorize, even if they might have cast said spells a thousand times by this point. Before Christopher Lee passed away, uh, he memorized the whole of Lord of the Rings, every goddamn page, so I'm pretty sure Gandalf should be able to recall Magic Missile whenever the hell he wants. 5th uh, edition put monks front and center with their core classes because it makes perfect sense. There isn't a single work of fantasy that doesn't make the mistake of, of excluding bare-fisted kung fu flying magic men from their setting. It reminds me of a famous Gardner Dozier quote, where he said, and I'm paraphrasing, there was no problem within a science fiction story which couldn't be solved by putting dinosaurs in it. And now we have magic monks. Not just martial artists, I'm talking goddamn immortal teleporting indestructible flying men wrapped in robes that can throw fire from their hands. Why bother being a fighter wielding a clumsy sword? A rust monster could reduce his armor to dust, but a monk could punch your colon through your throat and be naked doing it. It's like lining up the characters from the Fantastic Four film and thinking to yourself, okay, these make sense. We got water, earth, air, fire, and badass armor with lightning. For once, I would just like a martial artist and not some ridiculous retreading of an increasingly annoying cinematic cliche. Someone made an argument that saving throws were intended to be a last-ditch survival role to prevent something horrible from happening. Unfortunately, it evolved into the single die roll you were given to prevent the instant and utter eradication of your character. One random number generator disregarding your AC and hit points, which would wipe your character from that plane of existence. At least with 4th edition, nothing could ever kill you dead unless you were already close to dying. Some people will applaud that brutal nature of the game, but there's a point where that stops being fun, especially when it's your character. I wouldn't mind saving throws if it truly was a last-ditch last effort. A monster fires a text vision, rolls to attack and hits, and then you get your saving throw, a double chance to avoid petrification. 
I haven't even gone into the mechanics themselves, a topic I've ranted about previously. Why does a melee attacker have to roll to attack, but a spell fall to, to the defender to roll? This was another point 4th edition got right. 5th edition goes halfway, crystallizing the problem while simultaneously only partially addressing it. There shouldn't be a separate mechanic for spells and melee attacks. Die rolls, die rolls should fall to the attacker. If saving throws are required, make it for extreme spell effects and only after an attack has succeeded. This also leads me to my next issue. So let me get this straight. I get hit with a fireball and wear no armor. My AC is entirely dex based, but I still make a dex based saving throw which is not connected to my AC. If I wore armor, said armor should provide protection against fire, because stuff you wear just does that. It's one of the reasons why we wore clothes. And yet it doesn't, and said fireball is entirely based on a separate mechanic to my claimed primary defensive statistic. Armor class has always been an obsolete concept which should have been abandoned with the eradication of Thaco. To then create a separate saving throw or defense for avoiding things, and what you have is this clumsy set of situations which are arbitrarily categorized to affect only certain situations. So when said dragon breathes fire, our poor fighter has no hope because apparently being draped in four layers of cloth and metal provides zero protection. And what annoys me the most is that the solution has been easy from the get-go. AC should be about avoidance and armor should be about damage resistance. It's called hardness, a mechanic the game already has. In order to prevent players from utterly crucifying DMs when that solitary saving throw versus death has failed, D&D placated the masses by making death, well, annoying. Dying means very little. Don't bother with tears or burial rites. Just make sure the body is intact until you can FedEx it to Miracle Max, ensuring the corpse is only mostly dead. Let's get the obvious out of the way. There is no society in any reality which can function with commonplace resurrection. When mortality and economics com combine, what you have left are legions of suffering peons which would hold every cleric to the fire to bring their dead wife or child back to life. And yet death and resurrection is a staple of gaming. Well, actually it's not. In fact, few games outside of MMOs really involve true resurrection with little to no penalties. Most games actually feature save games, meaning the situation just becomes a giant do-over. You may think that's a jarring mechanic, but consider how valid the alternative is to a legitimate fantasy setting. Death should mean something more than a slight financial burden. Sometimes I think wizards have their oddball mechanics in order to justify other classes. Nearly every edition of D&D has had a huge spells chapter encompassing, in some cases, half the book. No matter what spellcaster you make, they all tap from the same list, with some sharing the same spells. But do we truly need all of them? And what fantasy world would take them all? Most settings only permit one, maybe two. Do we really need a cleric, wizard, sorcerer, druid, bard, paladin, ranger, and in some cases even a warlock? Sorcerer and wizard are basically the same class, which, with some clumsy mechanics separating them, thus proving the mechanical limitations on each are kind of meaningless. Second, do we really require our paladins and rangers to be spellcasters? Do we really need a bard spellcaster? And then to have every one of these function with the exact same mechanics tapping the same spell list, often sharing identical features from other spellcasters, it makes the whole ordeal, well, an ordeal. I've not run a game without outright banning most of them. I don't mind wizard, and I don't mind druid. I have separate feelings on Cleric, but most of the others could fall between the couch cushions. Do you want to make a Dwarf Druid? Well, don't, because you're stupid. Apparently that's the argument from power gamers everywhere. Unlike human beings, fey races, you know, halflings, elves, and such, are skewed to specific roles, cliches, even stereotypes. This can almost be considered racial profiling. This ethnic group is populated by terrorists, while this ethnic group are all thieves, just like halflings. And why wouldn't you make a character this way? Bonuses from being an elf generally boost your intelligence and dexterity, so why be anything other than a class using those attributes? For a brief time, 4th edition played with the idea of customization, but 5th edition runs right back into static boosts. Something Pathfinder is still stubborn to change. Despite creative gamers trying concepts purely out of some private fantasy, hardcore gamers are always smart enough to find the killer combination of classes and races to make one clearly superior to others. 
Fantasy worlds may wallow in cliche. Do we have to create mechanics for it? Hate it, hate it, hate it. I hate alignment so much. I ignore it utterly in every game I play. Fourth edition tried to downplay the system somewhat, but my perspective is that it should go completely. I find it irksome when people try to categorize me in real life. So I find it annoying and unnecessary when a game implements it as a rule. I don't mind holy and unholy dichotomies, but good and evil is at its basic philosophical level quite nebulous. To them, impose mechanics around lawful and chaotic ideals and then make abilities based on them is unwanted and unneeded. I simply tell my players that they have to play heroes and let them define for themselves what that means. Do you remember that famous fantasy book where a band of intrepid heroes went on a quest wearing a million gold coins worth of magical items which they purchased at a nearby bazaar? Of course not, because that's insane. I've always wondered about any game where plucky heroes are walking around with magic items worth more than the kingdom they are trying to save. You couldn't even assume one was a family heirloom since after four levels you'll have to sell it to get a better variant. I've actually seen adventures with magical, polished, perfect armor, sporting rings, cloaks, amulets, and periaps right into town in a rickety old caravan. They were all of this, ignoring the sensible alternative of perhaps trading it all in in exchange for a castle made of solid silver in order to slay a dragon for the sole purpose of acquiring more gold and purchasing slightly better magic. It makes you question the sanity of the adventuring profession. They sleep in the mud under the stars, and then put on their plus five armor to kill some trolls. Peasants would look on and ask themselves, why did they buy magic armor? Why didn't they buy food? The constant drive to acquire better magic items is something we tolerate in ridiculous video games, but even some of those create mechanics allowing you to keep the same weapon for the entire progress of your character. The items in particular simply get better as characters do. Readers may imagine certain mechanics they would want to add to the list. Some people criticize classes. I don't generally. This is one where I don't mind filling a mold. As for deities, yes, I admit I hate them, but I also understand it's part of the D&D canon. I just cut them out of my own personal settings. What would you like to see gone from D&D, even though you know perfectly well it never will be? Put it down in the comments and I'll read them. Anyway, this has been Chris from DSX Machina.